You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. And welcome to this, another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you, and so glad that we have this opportunity to once again open up God's Word and to study together. We encourage you to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study as we spend time in the book of God. We encourage you to take any notes that you'd like to take as well, and certainly feel free to study and write down the things that you have interest in. If you have any questions at all, you can certainly contact us and ask your Bible questions. That's the thing about this program is we want to just find out what does the Bible say? What does the Scripture teach? What is the Lord teaching? What is He telling us? What can we find in Scripture? Because here before you, this Bible, the Bible that you possess, is a book that is like none other. Because the book that is the Bible has uh, within it the words of God of heaven. No other book has that. No other book can make that claim. There are many books that have been written down through the years. Certainly the Bible uh, even itself talks about the making of many books. There is no end. And much study is a weariness to flesh. So says Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Yes, you can make many books as far as that's concerned, but there's only one Bible. There's only one book that re reveals to us the will of God, the mind of God, and tells us what God wants us to do, how He wants us to live, what He expects of us, and what's necessary to prepare to leave this world and go on to the next. And so I hope that you'll get a Bible out and follow along as we study and learn from the pages of inspiration. What I want us to do is look at a specific uh, situation, a specific event there in the life of Christ. It is one that is well known, I'm sure, to many people. And uh, for our purposes, we could look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, certainly because all four gospel records speak of this event. But I'm going to focus our attention to Luke chapter 23 as we look at the events surrounding the thief on the cross. That thief that was there nearby Jesus and the one who uh, would later uh, would get after his fellow uh, thief and fellow robber for uh, his ridicule of Jesus. And the one who asked Jesus to remember me when you come into your kingdom. That very one. I want us to focus on him because I'm sorry to say that he has been the focus of a lot of false doctrine through the years. He has been the focus of a lot of false teaching. And so it would do us well to set this event in its context, to set this aright, and to learn and to see just what was being said at this point in time, and how that applies to each and every one of us. So look in your Bibles, if you will, Luke chapter 23. And like I said, I recognize we could read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, for the events surrounding the crucifixion. And it would be wise to do that, but Luke is the one that records not just the fact that there were thieves crucified on either side of Jesus, but Luke records the fact that there was a, there were a, you know conversation going on. There was dialogue between these folks, if you will, and the fact that one uh, specifically makes such confessions, makes such statements to Jesus in the time period in which he'd done. Because you re remember that if you're familiar with this, that the fact that the crucifixion when folks were crucified, the very fact of crucifixion was such a trauma and was such a stress and a strain upon the body that even for someone to speak uh, took an, an enormous amount of energy. It just took everything you had in you to be able to speak and to, and to discuss and such as that. And it took all of your, your energy, like I said, because it was so hard to breathe. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want you to look at this and consider well what's going on. The Bible says that when they led Jesus away, this begins in Luke 23, verse about number 26, and how they led Jesus away, and there was one man there named Simon of Cyrene, they compelled him to carry the cross of Christ. And as Jesus was going, there was a great multitude, it says, of people that were mourning Jesus, lamenting, and that kind of thing. As you come down there in verse number 32, it says two others, Luke 23, verse 32, two others who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. That is, be put to death with Christ. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, place of the skull, Golgotha, Calvary, 
when he came to that place that's called a skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right hand, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. It says, But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. And it says they came up uh, there and they said uh, the, that they came up and offered him wine. And they said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And in fact, it says there was a description over, uh, over him, an inscription. It said, this is the king of the Jews. Now, in other places, we'll understand that, that what happened here was that Pilate had made a writing. And Pilate wrote it in, in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin that this is the king of the Jews. And then later on, some folks would come to him and they'd say, you, do, you don't, don't say this is the king of the Jews. Say that he said he was the king of the Jews. And then he said, well, what I've written, I have written. And so as we look here in this scripture, we, we, we're just seeing these scenes going on. Here these uh, thieves have come, these robbers have come. They're with Jesus, going to be crucified just like him. And of course, you remember crucifixion. They would take and would, would nail. In this case, they nailed him. We recognize sometimes the crucifixion, they'd tie you to a cross. That's not the case here. They took nails and nailed Jesus to a cross. That's exactly what happened. And you not only read about here how they crucified him, but also later whenever Jesus is raised alive, you remember, and he speaks to uh, the apostles uh, there except for Thomas. And then about a week later, then here comes Thomas. And he says, uh, feel the nail prints. See, thrust your hand into my side and things. So, so he had nail prints. So what they did was they nailed him to a cross. And they nailed him. The, the, there was a different ways to nail um, people to a cross, by the way. But this in particular lends itself to the idea of, of the T uh, form or the T version. There we had, instead of a capital T like this, like a, a lowercase T. And the reason why I say that is because it said above him was the inscription that said to the king of the Jews, this is the king of the Jews. So they had to have something above him there. And they nailed him, they stretched his arms out, and and would in, in the stretching of his arms they would then nail, really nail into the wrist. And because the wrist bones were found actually to be able to to hold the weight of somebody, if you nail actually through the palm of your hand, through here they uh, well just by experience, they had learned, the Romans had learned, others had learned by, that if you had it through the nail of the hand, right there, that flesh and meat right there in that bone, the, uh, the weight of the body, the upper weight of the body, they'd fall off. But you could nail back here, back off the wrist bone, and the wrist bones were strong enough to hold with, between both of them to hold the upper body. And so that's what they did. They cut through the median nerve and then nailed on into the cross. And that's what held you up, at least the upper body. And then took the feet, and a lot of times overlapped the feet, and would nail the feet together that way. There would be a little board uh, where someone could kind of rest against. They kind of, it's like a little seated protrusion, a little piece of a board right there. And they could kind of sit on that, I, I suppose, or whatever, lean up against it. It wasn't comfortable, it wasn't nice. It wasn't an easy chair, it's just a little thing you kind of rest on a little bit. And then folks would kind of kick off from from where your feet were over overlapped and nailed, you kind of kick off from there, uh, kick off from the back in order to breathe. And that's why I said it's such a such a hardship to breathe, because you had to move in order to breathe. Well, here the median nerves have been severed in both hands and both arms, and so it's just extreme pain uh, as you move even, and then to to push off. Uh, there to the to the cross to push away from it in order to breathe in order to allow your lungs to expand and what they found was uh, I mean after a while it just became easier not to breathe than it did to breathe uh, and so finally people would just die they actually would die uh, of drowning in that sense because your lungs would fill up with fluid we, we think about congestive heart failure today we might be familiar with that term congestive heart failure well that's the idea only this was just in, in, in hours, in, in, in a day or two, whatever, but it would just come upon you like that because you couldn't breathe and the fluid would build up in the chest cavity and it would drown you. And so uh, when you talk about crucifixions as a rule, as a rule, crucifixions uh, were 
the death from a crucifixion was not caused by blood loss. It was caused by, uh, like I said, by drowning, basically, by filling your lungs and, and the heart cavity and all that with that fluid, and it stopped, stopped the organs. We recognize that Jesus was beaten, uh, beaten severely, and his back was bleeding, his head, he had crown of thorns on his head, and things like this. We recognize there's a lot of blood he was losing, so I'm not trying to to you know, take away from that point at all, but I'm just talking about what the crucifixion would have been about. That's what Jesus endured. That's what those two thieves endured. Now continue to read. These people were mocking Jesus. And they come down, the Bible says, that in verse 39, that one of the criminals was hanged on him, railed, which hanged there, railed at him, and saying, uh, If thou art the Christ, save thyself and us. If you're the Christ, why don't you just save yourself and save us too, by the way. Think about that. Does that sound familiar? That, at least that phrasing? Think about this. Remember whenever Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4 and also recorded in Luke chapter 4, Satan continued to come to him saying, If you are the Son of God, if you are. See? Well, same idea. If you are the Christ. See? If you are Him. Well, then just save yourself and save us too. But the other rebuked him. And he said, uh, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me, or Lord, some versions say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then the we kind of pass from the scene to that, and then we focus more upon things that Jesus had done and finally by the by Luke chapter 23 and there verse 46 that's when Jesus breathed his last he gave up the ghost there as you will and so that's that's in his death and so here's some of the last words Jesus is saying upon this earth and some of the last words he is saying are are words of forgiveness are words that are given in this case and saying today you'll be with me in paradise well, what does it mean to be in paradise? Well, to be in paradise does not mean today you're going to go to heaven with me. That's not what that means. Paradise was specifically a realm within this place called Hades. Hades is referred to in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31, where those folks die. There were the rich man and Lazarus, and they die. The rich man goes to a place called Tartarus, a place of torment, place of fire, a place of, of pain and anguish, and all of that. Uh, that's where the rich man goes. Lazarus, then, Lazarus goes to a place that was called paradise, Abraham's bosom, place of rest and place of comfort. That's where he went to. And that's all discussed in Luke 16, 19 to 31, and more detail than what we're going to get into right now. But, but understand, that's what this is about. A little bit later in the book of Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, in referring to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Peter will quote from David. Peter will quote from the Psalms. And a quotation there saying, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, will not leave my soul in Hades. See, that was the point. Not going to leave my soul there. In other words, he's going to resurrect. He's going to come back from the dead. And that's exactly what happened. And so whenever Jesus talks to the thief about going to paradise, He's not saying today you're going to go to heaven. He's saying today you're going to go to this place of the disembodied spirits, this place, uh, this waiting place, if you will, this spiritual realm where the righteous people will be. Now, three days later, Jesus' soul will leave, see, will leave that Hadean realm and then come back and there will be a resurrection there upon the earth as we're aware of, and, and the stone will be rolled away, and Mary will see Jesus, and then the other apostles will see Jesus, and all of that. And Jesus will then be upon the earth for about 40 days before he finally ascends to his Father, Acts chapter 1. So this is all setting the stage for that. This is what's going on here in Luke chapter 23. Now I've laid all that groundwork as necessary to lay it so we understand what, what happens here. There's a lot of folks today who come along, they'll read about this thief on the cross, and they'll try to say, well, now that's for me. What I want is I'm going to be saved like the thief. And this has given rise to this so-called deathbed repentance, where people on their deathbed 
you know, ask for forgiveness and say they repent and all that, and then they just kind of, you know, want to be saved, and then moments later or a day later, or whatever, then they're dead. And then you'll have people alive saying, well, he must have been saved because after all, he had his deathbed repentance. And that's what happened here because, you know, the thief on the cross, he's not coming off the cross alive. He's going to die. And it's just a matter of time for him to die also. And so here, here's his deathbed repentance. You ever heard people talk about that? Or you ever heard this argument says, well, uh, people will try to argue against baptism. Being baptized for their remission of sins, even though Mark 16, 16 says to do it, and Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and Acts 22, 16, and even though 1 Peter 3, verse 21 says that baptism doth also now save us, you'll still have people say, well, no, I'm going to be saved like the thief on the cross because the thief on the cross was not baptized. Jesus saved him and he was not baptized, and so I'm going to do that and I'm going to be saved like the thief. Well, there's problems with that. And that's what I wanted us to get into and look into this. Consider well what's being said here because I'd suggest to you that this thief knew more than we give him credit for. And I'd suggest to you also this thief had a whole lot more faith than what we give him credit for as well. Somebody says, what do you mean? Well, just come back into this passage for a moment. Number one is the idea that, well, this thief was not baptized and he's never been baptized and he's certainly not going to be baptized now. And Jesus went ahead and saved him, so baptism is not necessary. You ever heard that argument? And people saying that they don't need to be baptized because the thief wasn't baptized. Well, let me suggest to you that's a huge assumption to just assume that this thief was not baptized. Somebody asked, what do you mean? Well, don't you remember John's baptism? Don't we remember that John had a baptism and he was baptizing people and the, all the multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people that came out to Jordan and Enon and other places where John was and he baptized them in all those places? Number two, don't you remember the fact that in John chapter 4 it tells us that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John? It says even though he himself didn't baptize anybody, but he was making and baptizing more disciples even than John was. Now, come back to this, this thief on the cross. Are we going to assume then, and it is an assumption, that he was not baptized? Somebody says, well, you just have as much proof that he was and that he wasn't. <laughs> That's right. I have just as much proof to say he was baptized as someone else has proof to say he wasn't baptized point is you can't prove it just by reading about this man being nailed to a cross. You can't prove that he wasn't baptized or that he was. But what I'm saying is this. You watch what he says here in a moment. Are these the words of a man who, I mean, does that make sense that these would be the words of a man who has never met Jesus before in his life? Are these the words of a man who is unfamiliar and as it were, uh, these men meet, meet one another there at the cross? Meet one another on Golgotha. Does that really make sense to you as you read this whenever it says that, that the one thief says, if you're the Son of God, see, if you are the Christ, if you're Him, save yourself and save us too. See, he's joining in with the mockery that was surrounding and crowding all the crowd down there. Keep reading. The other rebuked him and said, do you not fear God? For we, uh, since we're under the same sentence, we're under the same sentence of condemnation. We indeed justly. But this man, he says, has done nothing wrong, has done nothing amiss. I want to ask you something. How does he know that? How does that thief know that? And whenever you think about the words, and whenever you think about this, this speech, if you will, I mean, just a long uh, here, long statements being made by him and the pain it had to have, have uh, brought about in this thief and the hurting and, and the hardship that it is for him to breathe anyways and in him for him to answer and answer in the manner that he is. That's just amazing to me. And here's what he says. He says, uh, we are suffering justly. We're suffer We're, we deserve what we get. This man has done nothing wrong. Again, I ask you, how does he know if they're strangers that day, if they have never met before until this point in time, how does he know? Or is it that he does know who Jesus is? Could it be that this man 
was one of those disciples, was one of those people who was baptized, either baptized by John in preparation for Jesus, or was baptized uh, with Jesus, uh, you know, there at, at Jesus' beckoning, at Jesus' uh, behest, and there he was. And here's somebody who has gone off the be, uh, gone off the straight and narrow and gone and lived a life that he shouldn't have. Could that be the case? See that? Again, I'm not trying to say 100% that it is, but I'm saying look at the words that are recorded by this man. These are not the words of a man who's never met Jesus before. This man has done nothing wrong. How do you know? Unless he's been around him. And he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think about that. And the more you think about the, the day, the more you think about what was going on at that moment in time, you see how great and how, how amazing this really was. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How does he know about a kingdom? If they're complete strangers... See, if they've never met before that day, if they don't know one another and never knew one another till they were all three nailed to the cross together, all that man knows is there's a sign over Jesus that says King of the Jews. And here's this King of the Jews with a crown of thorns, bloody, beaten, ill-treated, everybody's ridiculing everybody, quote-unquote, all around, they're ridiculing, spitting on him. And to this one, he's going to say, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. If there's just strangers that day, that makes no sense. But if it is that he knows who Jesus is, and he is aware of Jesus, and yes, perhaps even baptized by Jesus or by John, it makes a whole lot more sense then. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Again, you think about coming into the kingdom. How does he know about the kingdom? How does he know anything about a kingdom, about Jesus Christ and his kingdom? How does he know any of those kinds of things if he's never heard about it or never known about Jesus until this day? How does he know about these things? How is he aware of this? Or is it the fact that this man did know and he was aware and he had heard the teachings and he had heard about it, but this man along the way has turned away from the teachings that he knew were right and he turned away from the truth and now he's gotten caught. And now he is the robber, you know, the thieves, the robbers, whatever, as you look at that. And now that's the problem. And now he is dealing with the consequences of his sin, and rightfully so. But he's not a man that's ignorant of who Jesus is. And here's this one has been beaten to a pulp, Jesus. He's been beaten to a pulp and nailed to a cross. And he's, his blood, the blood rushes from his, from his head, from the, from the thorns, from the crown of thorns. And he's bloody, his back is bloody, and he's been beaten, he's spit upon, and people are mocking him. I want to ask you something. Does that, does that sound or look very kingly to you? Doesn't sound very kingly to me if we're talking about an earthly king. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I want to suggest to you this man. This man's statement is a statement of faith, and it's a statement of a man who had faith at that time Faith perhaps even greater than what the apostles had. All the apostles forsook him and fled. All the apostles there, for, they ran away. They weren't even around him. And only John was there a little later on. And that's it. And this man says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Isn't that amazing? And that's when Jesus said, I say to you, very last I say to you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. We're going to talk about that today, thou shalt be with me in paradise business and what that means in greater detail and what it means such as deathbed repentance and who gets saved and all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about that too. But I want to lay this point down for us so we understand this man is, is not just an ordinary person. He's not just somebody that just is a stranger that showed up and it just so happened and there's, there are three of them being, and that is those two thieves and Jesus being crucified that day. It's more than that. This man obviously knows what's going on. This man obviously is aware of Jesus, who Jesus is. He's had to have heard him preach. He's had to have heard something about him and know about him to some degree to say the words that he's saying. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Notice that that's not a demand. That's not anything. He got after the other thief. He said, we're here justly. 
In other words, we deserve everything we're going to get, but he didn't deserve it. And so away with this idea that, that somehow this is just a blind, you know, blind thing. Folks, the thief, this thief in particular, knew who Jesus was, knew exactly what he was about, knew exactly about his kingdom, and is begging to be a part of it. That tells me something about that thief. And like I said, no, I can't prove 100% he was baptized uh, at all. And you can't either if you want to say that he wasn't baptized. But I'm saying when you look at the words he's speaking, and you look at the statements of faith that are coming from his mouth, I tell you what, this man is not ignorant of who Jesus is. He has seen Jesus before today. He has seen Jesus before this time. And he knows exactly who Jesus is and what he is about. That's the truth. Well, let's go ahead and we're going to stop right now. Let's take a break. We're going to come back. And I want to talk about the, the deathbed repentance, like I said, and the thief on the cross, being baptized, and all those kinds of things. And put that all in its context and in its perspective. And I hope that this study will be helpful to you, will be encouraging to you. You stay tuned. We're going to take a break. And we'll come back in just a moment. You're watching The Ancient Landmark. We invite you to visit with the Caneyville Church of Christ, meeting at 101 North Main Street in Caneyville, Kentucky. Visit our website at www.caneyvillechurchofchrist.com. Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages begin at 10 a.m. Sunday worship services begin at 10.45 a.m. and 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages begin at 7 p.m. And tune in to our radio program, The Ancient Landmark, Monday through Friday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. on 99.9 .9 FM WXMZ. Or listen live on the internet at www.vz. Dot voicetech dot com. Write to the Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261. For a free Bible correspondence course and a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. The Ancient Landmark airs on Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. And our question at this time asked us, how can you know which church is the right church? Well, that is a good question. How can you know which church is the right church? You look around today and we see so many churches uh, sprouting up all over the place, don't we? You'll find it just on any, any street corner, uh, some church, this church, another church, whatever it may be, Baptist church, Methodist church, and Catholic church, and Episcopalian church, and Pres Presbyterian church, and Pentecostal church, and the Mormon church, and the Methodist Church and the Church of Christ and the Christian Church and just on and on down the list. Church of God. Uh, just all kinds of different churches around. How can you know which church is the right church? How can you know which one is pleasing in the sight of God? And really, that's the key right there. When you ask the question, how can you know which church is the right church? Then my question becomes, uh, who is determining what is right? See, so if you're going to uh, say that God determines what is right, and I believe that's who does determine what is right, if you're going to uh, say that God determines the right church or whatever, the right anything, that God is the standard of authority, and He determines what is right and what is wrong, if you're going to go by that standard and say God must determine, then we must go by the Bible. The Bible describes for us a church. The Bible describes the fact that Jesus, in the long ago, promised to establish 
a church. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus speaks to Peter at that time. He said, I say also to thee that thou art Peter. Upon this rock, that is upon, based upon Peter's confession he made in Matthew 16, verse 16. Now in Matthew 16, verse 18, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus there at that time promised that based upon the confession of Peter, he said, I'm going to build my church based upon that. Based upon the confession of faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Based upon that, he said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell, Hades, death itself, he says, shall not prevail against it. Death will not stop it from coming. And that's exactly what happened as you continue to read through the scriptures. We see Jesus promising this church that was to come. And then by the time you get to the death of Christ on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, we then read after that happened, after the death and burial and resurrection and ascension of Christ in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 2, we read about the establishment or the beginning of his church. And you read about that, how the, the uh, gospel was preached there for the first time. And then based upon them hearing about Jesus Christ as the Son of God, his death and burial and resurrection, about 3,000 were saved, about 3,000 repented of their sins, Acts 2.38, and were baptized. Acts 2.47 says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. For the first time in human history, Acts 2.47 describes for us a church that was now in existence. A church that was not in existence in years gone by. It was not in existence before on earth. But now it is in existence and folks were being added to that church uh, there day by day. So if I'm going to find the right church, I'm going to find a church, I have to find a church that has its beginnings and its origin in Acts chapter 2. They're in Jerusalem. They're based upon the preaching of the gospel and the confession of Christ and being baptized for the remission of their sins that the Lord added uh, those folks to his church. And he continues to do so to this good day. You look around today and, and just with a, a studious eye and with a conscious uh, mind toward study and toward uh, you know investigation. Look around and see some of these churches. Some of these churches that had their beginnings even in America. Some churches had their beginnings in Europe in different places or in Rome and, and all around. They're just different parts of the, of the world. There's only one church that you read about that had its beginning in Jerusalem. There on the day of Pentecost following the Lord's resurrection and there to have that gospel, that gospel message preached, and there for folks to believe it and to obey it, and can follow, you can see that all the way through. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says there, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, the elders of the church at Ephesus. And he said there to them, Take heed to thyself, and do all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Here we see that the church which Christ made and purchased and built all those years ago was purchased with his blood. And so it is a church that's purchased with his blood. It is a church for which Jesus died. It is the church that's, that, that's beginnings you read about in Acts chapter 2. And uh, there in Acts 2, uh, there in verse 38 down through verse 47. Now, when you talk about finding the right church, right there, this origin, this beginning, and what this is all about, Right there eliminated 99.999% uh, of any church you've ever heard of. Because how many churches today we read about have their origins with men, or they have it at the wrong time, etc., etc. There's only one church that's found in the Scriptures, and it is that one uh, for which you read about in the Scriptures. Romans 16, verse 16 describes it as the Church of Christ. The churches of Christ salute you. Not only is this the case, Romans 16, 16, but also he talked about it being the church of God, Acts 20, verse 28. And before people run off and say, well, you know, it's the church of God, in other words, a denomination. No, no. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Who purchased the church with his blood? God the Son. So again, the church, the church of Christ. The church that belongs to him, the church that belongs to Christ. That's the church you read about in Scripture and no other. And we're back again, and we want to continue in our study of the book of God as we've been reading from Luke chapter 23 and verse 32 down to about verse 43. 
and we have laid some groundwork already about the crucifixion and what it, what it was like and what it was about. And then we also then built from there and talked about this thief and how this thief was not an ignorant person by any means when it came to Jesus, who he is, and what he's about, what his teaching was. And like I said uh, before the break, this was a statement of faith. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, that is, that is not insignificant. That is significant. When you think about somebody here, especially in the fact that even Jesus' own apostles, even those closest to him, did not have a real grasp of this kingdom business, and the fact that they were looking for an earthly kingdom, and thought he was going to you know, begin his earthly kingdom and all that, of course that's not what he was about. He had a spiritual kingdom. And then here's this man who says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All the other disciples had forsook him and fled. Like I said, this is a statement of faith. This man evidently believes that at this point in time, yes, Jesus nailed to a cross, and yes, he's bloody and battered and beaten and spit upon and ridiculed and mocked, but there is a victorious day that is coming. And that victorious day was going to be very soon. And when it gets here, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In other words, it's still coming. The kingdom is not lost. The kingdom is not over. The kingdom is not, uh, you know... In other words, there, all hope has not been abandoned. Here's somebody, this thief that understands there's something yet to come. And like I said, it's just amazing to me when I think about this, when I read these words, this uh, thief is no slouch. All right, This thief is not just some somebody that, that had no idea or no interest in God and his word. There's more to it than that. And yet this man suffers now because of the consequences of his deeds. And he was a robber, it says, and all of this. He was a thief. Uh, sometimes, uh, some, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, sometimes the description is malefactor. Sometimes the description is robber. Sometimes it is thief and all this kind of stuff. But the point, point of it is, here's a person who has done wickedly and, has, and is deserving. And he says, indeed, justly, we deserve death for what we have done. That is, to the other thief. He said, but Jesus doesn't deserve that. Now, as you come on down through, Jesus said to him, Today, I, you know, verily or truly, I say to thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so whenever he says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, he recognizes that this is a recognition of the fact that by the end of the day, both of them at least will be dead. And we know here in just a few moments, as you continue to read Luke 23, Jesus would die first. After Jesus died, then the two other thieves, they went to those on, on either side of Jesus, they broke their legs. The breaking of legs was done to hasten death. Uh, earlier on when we were talking about the mechanics of the crucifixion and what all went on, and how that people had to, literally had to push off the cross in order to breathe. You had to push off because, again, as your lungs expand, your body moves. And we're not conscious of that. Generally speaking, we're not conscious of that movement. But if you back up against a wall, say, or if you go over and, and you know, then try to breathe, you'll see your whole body moving as you breathe. If you ever had, had a chest x-ray, you'll experience something similar to this because whenever you have a chest x-ray, you know, they'll put you up, put the, uh, you know, thing, that you, you, you lean up against that so they can get a good picture and all this, and they set that plate up there, and then they say, okay, now take a deep breath, and they say, don't move. Well, you take a deep breath, and you move. And they say, now take a deep breath, don't move. Take a deep breath, don't move. Take a deep breath, don't move. Deep breath, don't move. Well, that's physically impossible, because if you're up against that, that plate in order to get the, uh, order, order the x-ray already, and then you take a deep breath, you move. I mean, that's just what happens, because your body moves. That's the idea behind the cross. You had to move in order to breathe. So... It says here, the Bible says, they went and broke the legs of those thieves in order to hasten death. Well, you break the legs, guess what? Can't move anymore. You have no leverage. You can't push off anymore because the legs that had been pushing you off of the cross in order to breathe can't push anymore. He broke them. Can't push. They die. So he says, today thou should be with me in paradise. By the end of the day, at least two of them, all three of them, really were dead. And now, he says, you're going to go to paradise. Again, that, that realm or that place where the saved people await judgment. Where Abraham is, Moses, where, um, well, where Elijah is, where 
Isaac, Jacob, Hannah, uh, Ruth, David. I mean, just go down the list. All these wonderful worthies. Mary is there. No, Mary is not in heaven. She's not in heaven with God. Mary is in this place called paradise. Because that's where all the dead people go to. They go to this place called paradise. Or I should say Hades. And then the righteous people would go to paradise. The wicked people go to Tartarus. That's what the Bible teaches, Luke 16. So whenever Jesus says this, that's what he's saying. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You'll be in this place where the saved people are, where the saved people belong. That's what it's about. Now, if you read this, someone will say, well, that's what I want to do. I just want to be saved like the thief. And, and you know, Jesus just said, you'll be with me in paradise, and so I can just be saved by, like the thief. I can just go ahead and just have my deathbed repentance, and then I don't have to worry about it. Go live as you want to for as long as you want to, and then by the time you get ready to die, go ahead and repent, and that'll be over with. That sounds, that might sound like a good idea to some people. To me, it sounds very foolish. And the reason why it's very foolish is, when are you going to die? When do you know? Now, this guy would know when he's going to die. He's been nailed to a cross. But are you going to be nailed to a cross? I mean, is that a big, you know, is that one of your plans? Is that on your bucket list to be nailed to a cross? I guess that'd be the last thing on the list, wouldn't it? But uh, is that what you're going to do? How are you going to die? Now, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 says, The living know that they shall die, but how's it going to happen? And how do you control that kind of thing? When will you die? That's the point. You don't know, do you? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 27 verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And yes, we, we ought to be familiar with the fact that there are those who have died in early age, in old age, middle age, and there's some that are babies, that, uh, you know, newborn babies and all that, stillborn babies. And just on down the list. You don't know when you're going to die, so how are you going to plan this deathbed repentance anyways? So that's one problem right there. And the next problem is this. How do you know that you can be saved that way? You say, well, Jesus saved the thief like that, so I guess I can too. Well, that might sound good, but, but don't you know that Jesus, uh, one time he saved a woman whenever she cried at his feet and uh, wiped or dried off his feet with her hair? Do you know that? And the Bible speaks about this, this uh, woman that Jesus said, Thy faith has saved thee. In other words, she became a saved person. When did she become a saved person? Well, she became a saved person when she cried at his feet and washed Jesus' feet with her tears and then wiped his feet with her hair. That's Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 44 down through verse 50. She continued to kiss Jesus' feet and cried at his feet and dried his feet with her hair. And Jesus said she's saved because of that. I want to know something. You want to be saved like her? I mean, why not? Why don't people say, I want to be saved like that woman that cried at Jesus' feet and dried Jesus' feet with her hair? I want to do that. I want to dry Jesus' feet with my hair. And I want to cry and cry and cry and cry so much as to be able to wash Jesus' feet. Think about that. Is that what you want to do? Why not? If not, why not? i tell you about another case. Another case in the book of Matthew. When Jesus saw the man that was let down by the four friends, is a paralyzed man. And his four friends knew that Jesus was over in the house. And they couldn't get in the house because the crowd was so large. And so what they did was they went and tore the, the roof off the house. And let Jesus, I'm sorry, let, let the paralyzed man down to where Jesus was inside the house. And whenever Jesus saw this and he saw what was going on, the Bible says that he told him, Thy, thy sins are forgiven. He forgave him of his sins right then. Now, somebody says, well, wait a minute. Uh, what about him? Why can't we just be saved like that guy? And, and as you read Matthew chapter 9, he says, as he saw their faith. As he saw their faith. In other words, as he saw the faith of those four men. Wasn't as he saw that man's faith. He saw the faith of his friends. And the faith of those four friends dropping him down in the middle of that house. And he says, thy sins are forgiven thee. And then he read the people's thoughts because the people's thoughts were like, hey, listen, he is blaspheming. 
And so Jesus said, well, which, which is easier? To say thy sins are forgiven thee, or rise, take up your bed, and walk? He said, but so that you know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he looked at him, and he said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the man did. He walked out the door. He was let down from the roof, and he walked out the door, carrying his, his pallet with him, carrying his, his little, what we would say, bedroll or whatever. He's carrying that with him. Now, why isn't it that those people are brought up, the woman or the, or the paralyzed man, why aren't these people brought up before us and said, we want to be like them and save like they were? I mean, why not? Jesus was healing them, wasn't he? And he saved them. He said, your sins are forgiven to the paralyzed man. And he told the, the woman the same thing. And he tells the thief on the cross the same thing. And later on, there's a man in Matthew chapter 19. He wanted to know what to do to be saved. He wanted to know what to do to go to heaven. Jesus said, sell everything you got. And he said, you give to the poor and you come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Read Matthew 19, beginning in verse number 16 and on down, about verse 21. And you're going to read about this man. Now, why aren't people today saying, I want to be saved like Jesus told that, that rich man to be saved by selling everything. I am just going to sell everything. So I can follow Jesus. I can give you, I'll give you some real quick answers as to why people don't want to follow that guy. But Jesus said he was going to be saved. He said, if you will sell everything you've got, you can follow me, you can have treasure in heaven, and you can come follow me. Just do that. I mean, why aren't people arguing for that one? Think about that. Jesus saved people. We've given four different examples of four different ways that Jesus saved four different people. Now to say, why is that? It's for this reason. When you come into the New Testament, you're going to see that while Jesus was upon this earth, Jesus healed people as he saw fit. Jesus forgave people as he saw fit. And yet whenever you come to the New Testament, I'm sorry, not the New Testament, but whenever you are in the New Testament, whenever you come to the time after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, then you see people being saved in only one way. Now before I gave you four examples of four people being saved four different ways. But after Acts chapter 2, then you find people being saved just one way. And that salvation is found when you hear the word of Jesus, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and are baptized. And whenever you do that, you follow the Lord's plan of salvation, you can become a saved person. And so that's found from Acts chapter 2 all the way through Acts chapter 19, no less than nine times in Scripture. This plan is, is shown. This plan is declared. And not a one time, not at any time, did those folks from Acts 2 to Acts 19 or on through the book of Revelation ever tell anyone, just say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom and you'll be saved. Not a one time did they say that. Not a one time did they say, cry at Jesus' feet and dry his feet with your hair and be saved. No one ever said that. There wasn't anybody who was ever told, uh, if you could get your four friends to lower you out of a roof, down through a roof, you can be saved. There's not a one time that was ever told. There wasn't one time ever from the book of Acts 2 on forward the Revelation where anyone was ever told, listen, sell everything you got and be saved. None of those times were used. Somebody says, well, wait a minute, then that sounds kind of inconsistent to me. If it's one time one way and one time another way, how do you know how to be saved? Well, the way you know how to be saved is by following what is taught in Acts chapter 2 all the way through Acts chapter 19. What is taught, what is given by inspiration by Jesus. See, here's the thing. While Jesus was upon this earth, he was setting forth and preparing his will. Sometimes, I mean, we today have wills, the last will and testament of so-and-so. While you're alive, you write your will. While you're alive, you write your will, and you say that certain things belong to certain people, and they can receive this at a certain time after my death. And this person, if you had a will, and this person got so much, and this person got so much, and this person didn't get anything, and this person got something else, something else, from your will, from your estate, from your property, whatever. And people have that, don't they? Well, it's the same idea here with Jesus. While Jesus was upon the earth, he was setting forth his will. And once he dies, then his will comes into effect. 
Number two, so long as you are alive, your will has no power. Do you know that? And so somebody, uh, sometimes you'll see these little uh, bumper stickers, not bumper stickers, but little license plates and things. And it says, I am spending my children's inheritance. Or spending my grandchildren's inheritance. You ever seen those little, uh, you know, license plates and things? I'm spending my grandchildren's inheritance. Well, what does that mean? Well, the, the idea is that, well, my children would have inherited my money, but I've decided to spend it now. Okay? Well, the thing about that is, as long as you're alive, that money is yours. That money is yours to do with whatever you please. Once you're dead, then that money would go to someone else. And once you're dead, that's when your will comes into effect and people carry out the, the will. They carry out the different particulars of that will. That's just what happens. That's just the way it goes. That's what, what you do legally. Well, it's the same idea here spiritually. Somebody says, well, what are you talking about? Well, in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, he talks about this. Hebrews chapter 9 speaks about a mediator and talks about the will of one and specifically talking about Christ's will. But he says in Hebrews chapter 9, he says, for where, where a will is, he says, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. Where the testator is, where the will is. You must have the death of that testator, for where a will is involved, the death of one must be made to make it be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. See? And that's at, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16, down through verse 17. And just kind of what we're talking about. The will is not in effect while people live. But once you're dead, then your will comes into effect. Well, it's the same way with Jesus. He was alive. While he was alive upon this earth, his will, his New Testament, had not come into effect. He was still living under the Old Testament. He's still living under the law of Moses. He had to fulfill it, Matthew 5, 17. And it, he, it was fulfilled once Jesus Christ had died. And he said, it is finished. So he's not even, at that point, his will is not in effect. Jesus could heal people however he wanted to. And if he chose to, to save someone, if he chose to save someone or heal them from their sins, that's another way to describe this, but to save somebody, uh, number one, with no faith at all, he could do it. If you want to save somebody because they cried at his feet, if you want to save somebody by saying, sell everything you got, if he wanted to save somebody based upon what they said at the cross moments before their death and his, that was up to Jesus to do. Just like if a man today has a, has a million dollars and he has a will then that, that states where this million dollars is supposed to go. But if while he's alive, he decides to send this, me, this, this much money over here and this much money over here and this much money over here and over here, that is his business. And the will has no effect. Once he dies, the will comes into effect. And now you must abide by what the will says. See? It's the same way with Jesus. Whenever he was alive, he could save people however he wanted to. But he set forth in his will that anyone that wants to be saved after his death, burial, and resurrection, anyone who wants to be saved then must be saved how? By by hearing the word of God, uh, Romans 10, 17, which produces faith, John 8, 24, to repent of your sins, Luke 13, verse 3, confess your faith in him, Romans 10, verse 10, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. And now, consistently, all the way through, from Acts chapter 2, consistently throughout the rest of the New Testament, consistently it is seen that whenever people are baptized, into Christ, there are, whenever the people are saved, they must be baptized into Christ, they must have confessed Him, they must have repented of their sins, and based all of that on their faith in Him that, and the gospel that they had heard. So it's based on all that. That is the plan. And so someone come around and say, well, I'm just going to have deathbed repentance. I'm just going to wait till I'm about dead and then go ahead and repent then. Well, number one, you're, you are assuming too much. 
you're assuming you're going to know when your death is. But number two, or perhaps this should have been number one, is that's not the way to be saved anyway. Jesus didn't say wait till you're just about dead and then repent. What he said was you believe on Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized. That's what it takes. That's what's necessary to be saved and nothing else. And if you're going to be saved today, this is the way it's going to happen, and in no other way. And again, someone goes back and says, well, what about that thief on the cross? The thief on the cross was living. Jesus was alive, and so this was before his will came into effect. Before that will came into effect, and Jesus saved him then. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And he had every, Jesus had every right to do it. Jesus is the Son of God. He had every, every right to do whatever he wants to. And he did it. But after his death, then that's why I'm saying, you don't find people saying, well, if you just say, remember me when you come into your kingdom, then you'll be fine. Or just cry, you know, cry a bunch. Or sell everything you got. Or let someone, you know, push you down or, or, or let you down through the roof into somebody's house. If you let somebody let you down through the roof of somebody's house, you're saved. That's not what happened. And that never was what happened. Because once Christ's will came into effect, there's not but one way to be saved. Now I want to ask you something. Are you living before the will of Christ is enacted or after the will of Christ is enacted? Answer that one and you've said it. We all recognize that we're all subject to the will of Christ, to the testament. We're subject to what Jesus has, has said and what he has brought into effect since his death. It is a better covenant that is established upon better promises. So reads the book of Hebrews also. A better covenant established upon better promises and that's what we're subject to. And that being the case, there's not but one way to be saved today. Not but one way. You're not going to go back and look at the thief on the cross or, or the other thief on the cross. You're not going to look at anyone else. You've got to look at the examples found in the book of Acts. From Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 19, folks consistently hearing God's word, believing in Jesus, the Son of God, they repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ like the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, when he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and am baptized for the remission of sins. And when many of the Corinthians, Acts 18 verse 8, when many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized, those folks were saved. And what they did I mean, read Mark 16, 16. Tell me that's not parallel exactly. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Many of the Corinthians, hearing God's word, believed it and they were baptized. Wonder what happened next. They were saved because they followed what the Lord said to do. They followed that plan, that, uh, that covenant, that new covenant under which we all are subject to this good day. i tell you what, that's the truth. And so let's not use the thief on the cross as an excuse for uh, not being baptized. Let's not uh, you know, argue about this anymore. Let's not fight about it and all that. Let's just do what the Lord says. Let's live as the Lord wants us to live. Be what the Bible makes us. Serve Him. Be a Christian. Be a child of God. Have our sins forgiven and be right in the sight of God. I tell you, I'm so thankful for this time. So thankful for our study together. And I hope that this study about the thief on the cross helps you. And helps put a lot of these things into perspective for us. If I can help in any way, if I can study with you, I want to do it. And let's talk about these things of a spiritual nature. Study God's Word. Learn what God has to say. Follow it and live it all the days of our life. I'm so thankful for this time. and so thankful for our study together. And until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day. You've been watching The Ancient Landmark. Tune in weekly on Monday at 9 p.m. Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., Wednesday, 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., or Friday at 9.30 a.m. Write to the Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261.